Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Dante Tapo, and I'm one of our two student fellows this year. We tend to think we know a lot about the Roman Empire, or at least I do. I was disabused of that notion here at the head table when I started describing my hypothesis for the presence of a, of a villa and just saw everyone shaking their heads saying, what is this man saying? But the average layperson can probably name an emperor or two, and we liberal arts students ought to know quite a bit more than that, simply based on the legacy of the Latin classics in our formal education. But these understandings of the Roman Empire are predominantly top-down, focusing on urban elites who had writings, monuments, and coliseums to leave behind. Peasant life, which included about 90% of the Mediterranean population of the time, was much different and far less understood. And that is where Professor Campbell Gray steps in. Cam Gray is an associate professor of classical studies at the University of Pennsylvania. A social historian, he has written extensively on how small communities worked in the late and post-Roman world. He co-directs the Roman Peasant Project, a multidisciplinary investigation into the life ways of peasants in southern Tuscany during the Roman period, and includes on-site excavations in Grosseto, Tuscany. This project is not simply a free vacation to the t under the Tuscan sun, however. The Roman Peasant Project incorporates these historical and archaeological sources to develop a thick description, comprehensive, of present life in the Roman Empire. As the recipient of a Mellon New Directions Fellowship, his work increasingly focuses on the complex dialectical relations between human populations and their living environments. His first book, entitled Constructing Communities in the Late Roman Countryside, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2011 and will be available for purchase outside at the conclusion of the talk. As always, audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited, and please join me in thanking Professor Cam Gray to the Athenaeum. Thank you, Dante, for that uh, very charming introduction. Um, it's all untrue, completely untrue. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for the invitation to visit Southern California at a, a time where Philadelphia is perhaps not the funnest place to be in the world. Um, I'm, I'm uh, somewhat daunted by the rich uh, history and inheritance of, of the Athenaeum, and I hope that uh, what I give you this evening will be uh, at least within the ballpark of the uh, extraordinary collection of, of presenters you've had over the last several years. Um, <clears throat> this is a project which, uh, as, as Dante suggested, has, has come out of uh, a recent uh, experience of retraining uh, somewhat and, and moving into environmental fields. Um, I say right from the start that I'm not really sure that I've got control of all of the material, um, and so I look forward to being uh, helped and to being shown where I have completely lost control of the material um, in, in the conversation that follows. <clears throat> in contemporary scholarly and popular debates, climate change appears in a number of guises and plays a number of roles. It is simultaneously a generalising catch-all description of observed phenomena, a deus ex machina explanation for a host of seemingly disparate processes, and a moral argument about the nature of interactions between humans and the world in which they live. While it seems reasonable to suggest that the ferocity uh, with which modern discussions of the topic are transacted is in some sense a product of the particular political and cultural conditions of the late 20th and early 21st century, it's also the case that environmental degradation has long been a staple in narratives of the fall of empires and societies. We should not be surprised to discover, therefore, that scholars have long invoked environmental arguments in accounts of the nature and fate of the late Roman world. Beginning in the 19th century, for example, political, economic and social strands of this debate were combined. Degradation of the soil as a result of changing environmental conditions and a poor understanding of agricultural practices were identified as causational factors in the devolution in the condition of the peasantry. In this way, the so-called free peasant proprietor of the Republic and High Empire became transformed in the medieval period into an ensurfed labourer bound to his master and the land he farmed by a collection of legal and customary bonds. In more recent scholarship, this picture has been subjected to a certain amount of criticism and reconstitution. More nuanced analysis of the legal evidence for the condition of rural tenants in the late Roman period together with detailed soundings into the range of literary, epistolary, and religious texts of the period, 
have resulted in a picture of peasant agricultural practices in the period which emphasizes their inherent economic rationality and logic and acknowledges the existence of mechanisms and structures for dealing with interannual and interregional variation in environmental conditions and agricultural productivity. Meanwhile, over 50 years of archaeological survey and excavation have produced a far more substantial and subtle, if still patchy and selective picture of the distribution of the rural population over the late Roman countryside. Consequently, large scale, broad brush assumptions of a generalized crisis of agriculture in the period have largely been eschewed in favor of detailed micro-regional studies and nuanced accounts which stress the complex relationship between continuity and change in this transitional period. <clears throat> However, the fundamental notion of a transformation or uh, if not necessarily a decline in agricultural practices remains strongly embedded both in scholarship concerned with the nature of the late Roman state and its agents and in attempts to understand the tangible differences in the number and size of identifiable rural settlements between the second and sixth centuries. Most recently, scholars have turned to environmental and climatological data in an attempt to address these questions. But far from providing solid objective foundations upon which one interpretation or another can solidly be built, that data has served to amplify difference, disagreement and uncertainty. <coughs> My intention tonight is to explore the reasons for this and to identify some ways in which existing scholarly paradigms concerning agriculture and the countryside of late antiquity have shaped and constrained the questions that have been asked of the climatological and environmental data. This paper functions, therefore, as an exploration of the current scholarship in the burgeoning interdisciplinary field of climate history of the late Roman and early medieval period and a pointer towards where this field might profitably go into the future. In pursuit of this project, I focus in particular upon explicating the phenomenon of environmental change, identifying three temporal scales at which that phenomenon must be approached. Uh, first, interannual uh, variation. Second, gradual changes in the broad parameters uh, uh, of the physical uh, climatic conditions. And finally, sudden perturbations of the physical environment or the atmosphere. And this is actually a, um, a representation of the uh, volcano Vesuvius erupting in 472 CE. The changes that take place at these different temporal scales, I suggest, necessitate different kinds of response mechanisms from agriculturalists, as well as leaving different types of evidence that must be approached in different ways by modern scholars. We must imagine, for example, that peasants in the late Roman world were equipped to deal with variation on a year-to-year -year scale. However, more permanent changes in prevailing weather patterns may have presented more significant challenges, depending on the speed, the suddenness, and the nature of those changes. Meanwhile, the impact of a large-scale natural event such as a volcanic eruption upon atmospheric conditions may have been sudden, geographically widespread, and over a temporal scale it was potentially disastrous for small-scale subsistence farmers. It's vitally important that these three types of change be clearly identified and clearly distinguished from one another, for only in this way can scholars begin to determine whether such changes in agricultural practices and patterns as can be identified from the late Roman world should be attributed to climate change or not. <clears throat> as a preliminary to such a determination, it's important to make two observations. First, the effect of climatic change upon societies is by no means uniform. Different economic or socio-economic sectors of a society will be affected differently and will adapt or not adapt in different ways to climatic stress. Second, <clears throat> the effects of climatic change and indeed of climate itself will be different in different geographical regions and will vary according to a collection of factors including topography, wind patterns, hydrology, geology and soil characteristics. As a consequence, any generalizations about either climatic conditions in the period under discussion here or the effects of those conditions upon human populations must be made with care. Broadly speaking, reconstructions of past climates rely upon three types of data. First and most reliable are instrument-based readings or records of climate made by contemporary observers. This type of material is unavailable prior to around the 17th century, so we have none of that. Uh, 
The second category of evidence derives from literary and documentary sources, including letters, chronographies, and calendars. For the current study, these potentially provide a great deal of information, although that information must be treated with caution, as it often amounts to reportage of isolated meteorological events, and thus gives little hard evidence for climate over an extended period of time. Third is proxy data, including pollen and grain analysis, dendrochronology, which is tree ring dating down here on, on, uh, on the bottom, uh, speleothems and lake valves, so stalactites and stalagmites. Lake valves are um, basically depositions of sediments in the bottoms of lakes, <coughs> and evidence from long series ice cores extracted from contexts in Greenland. In recent decades, huge strides have been taken in refining both the granularity and detail of this class of data and the questions being asked of it, with the result that it is now possible to make confident assertions about medium to long-term trends in climate, and in some circumstances at least, to obtain quite detailed accounts of regional or local climatic conditions over considerable periods of time. <coughs> Building on various combinations of these data sets, Scholars have sought to reconstruct past climates and their impacts on societies. Such studies have had a somewhat checkered history and have tended to be enlisted in explaining apparently self-evident phenomena rather than providing data for asking particular questions about interactions between ancient societies and their environment. The phenomenon of collapse of empires, for example, has seemed particularly ripe for environmental explanation and in this regard the late Roman Empire has been no exception. Among the most influential early exponents of an environmental model for the transformation of the late Roman world was Ellsworth Huntington, who began his 1917 article with the statement, the fact of the disastrous fall of Rome is so obvious that every intelligent person is aware of it, <coughs> and went on to construct a bold, if to a modern audience, somewhat problematic theory concerning uh, the disastrous effects of changes in precipitation and temperature upon human populations. While this interpretation was enthusiastically adopted by some contemporary scholars, the issue of climatic change gradually receded from centre stage in accounts of the late Roman Empire. So much so that in 1970, the second edition of a collection of papers concerning the fall of Rome replaced Huntington's article with one on dysgenic lead poisoning, perhaps giving some indication of the seriousness with which climatic explanations were regarded. <coughs> During the last two decades of the 20th century, scientists and scholars have become more aware of climate change as a potential factor in both contemporary and historical contexts, and more sensitive to the possibilities that the archaeological and environmental data present. A first step was to acknowledge the multiplicity of possible factors in explanations of societal change, a position expressed elegantly by Ingram, Farmer and Wigley, who noted that cases in which societies appear to have been seriously damaged by or even totally succumbed to climatic stress should not be taken to demonstrate the determining influence of climate. It is essential to consider ways in which these societies might have coped better and to focus on the political, cultural and socio-economic factors which inhibited them from doing so. These studies eschewed environmental determinism and evinced deep suspicion of explanations which posited straightforward chains of cause and effect. But they also recognised that the impact of climate on society should not be ignored. In the most recent scholarship, <coughs> there's been a marked renewal of interest in the relationship between the Roman state and its citizens on the one hand, and the world in which they lived on the other. Scholars from a range of disciplines across the humanities, social and environmental sciences have begun to collaborate and communicate much more closely with one another. In a recent publication edited by Piero Leonello and focused upon the climate of the Mediterranean in past, present and future contexts, considerable attention has been devoted to detailing the nature reliability and availability of a multitude of different types of proxy data which together are generally employed in reconstructions of ancient climate. Contributors to this volume present an indispensable account of the current state of the field of Mediterranean paleoclimatology with particular reference to the climate of the past 2000 years. They largely eschew historical explanation acknowledging the close interactions between human populations and the environment in this region over the past two millennia but preferring to present the data in a descriptive rather than an explanatory mode. Meanwhile, in an exhaustive and sophisticated account of the climate of Europe and the Mediterranean during the Roman period, Michael McCormick and his collaborators place a range of data and proxy data in conversation with one another, 
testing out both the points of congruous, congruence and the points of divergence between these sources and creating in the process a picture of climatic conditions over a period of 900 years. <coughs> the particular value of this exercise lies in its sensitivity to differences in the experiences of the eastern and western parts of the Mediterranean, while the authors also make tentative and suggestive connections between particular climatic conditions on the one hand and economic and political processes on the other. Naturally, disagreement persists over both the nature of such changes as can be discerned in the historical record and the effects of those changes. Nevertheless, these and other recent studies have put our understanding of past climates of the Mediterranean on a new footing. They've also pointed the way towards future needs and future opportunities as we explore the complex of demographic, economic, political and environmental factors in the various experiences of human populations throughout history. However, two significant challenges continue to hinder our efforts to use the currently available proxy data for reconstructing the interplay between climate and agriculture in the late Roman and early medieval period. The first is a problem of scale, both geographical and chronological. <coughs> in recent scholarship, the potential for climatic conditions to vary considerably over quite short distances has been repeatedly stressed, and this acknowledgement has been accompanied by calls for micro-regional studies of climate and climate change. However, the nature of the proxy data militates that it is somewhat unevenly distributed, both in time and in space. Uh, speleothems, for example, can be found only in very specific contexts. And that's this bottom left uh, illustration. Uh, Long-term dendrochronological sequences, tree ring dates, uh, are relatively rare and rely upon the existence of particular types of trees. And this is in the top left, the spots where we have uh, reliable tree, link, tree ring dating sequences. <coughs> Uh, and these trees only grow in certain areas. Changes in the chemical makeup of sed sedimentary deposits in rivers and lakes can occasionally be discerned and used to reconstruct extreme rainfall events, but detailed data sets are hard to come by. Meanwhile, uh, records of ancient pollens, botanical remains, uh, and human and animal bones, essential for the reconstruction of past diet and therefore useful in conversations about past environmental conditions, are available from some excavated contexts. Uh, but remain rather underrepresented and underutilised. Most crucially for the present purposes, these various data sets rarely coexist in time and space, and more rarely still do they coincide with any kind of textual evidence. This requires some interpretation or slate of hand in order for the various data sets to be made to speak to one another. But at what remove do such projects become analytically meaningless? Clearly stream bed deposits from Syria are largely irrelevant in the context of discussions about alluviation in Spain. But can data from the Alpine region of France be used to explicate the Rhone Delta? We have not yet adequately negotiated the relationship between data that reflects conditions on a large scale across a broad geographical or temporal range and data that speaks to much smaller scale or temporally restricted events. And while micro-regional studies are surely desirable, there are only a small number of contexts where such studies are even feasible. The second significant challenge facing scholars in this rapidly developing interdisciplinary field is that of limited mutual understanding producing uncertain circularity. And if you can drag your eyes away from that, you'll do better than, than, than I. <coughs> it's got me on the screen here. Uh, it's often the case that in interpreting the paleo-environmental data, the scientists draw upon explanatory paradigms drawn from large-scale narratives of the transformation of the late Roman world. Those explanatory paradigms are, in turn, then re-adopted by historians and social scientists who turn to the scientific community for objective quantifiable data with which to make their own arguments. In both cases, the method is problematic. Rhetorical arguments in historical accounts of the period do not occur in a vacuum and must be evaluated alongside and in dialogue with the positions against which they're being argued. Meanwhile, the scientific data is as open to interpretation as a literary text and requires a careful and nuanced evaluation of sample sizes, margins forever, and the range of possible interpretations. In sum, this collaborative venture between historians and climate scientists is still very much in its infancy. For neither party is yet familiar enough with the subtleties and the intellectual frameworks of the other's field to make most effective use of the opportunities that such interdisciplinary work promises. Nevertheless, it is true that the potential benefits of such collaboration are great, as recent projects have already demonstrates. 
And what follows, therefore, I aim to build upon these projects, outlining what seems relatively firmly established about climate change in the late antique period, and also identifying areas where greater clarity, more data, or further analysis might be useful. Any account of climatic conditions of the Mediterranean region in antiquity must start with the present. The current climate of the area is in large part determined by the presence and characteristics of the Mediterranean Sea, the complex and variable morphology of the land masses that surround the sea, uh, and the location of the region between the subtropical zone to the south and the temperate zone to the north. As a result, there exists considerable variation in the spatial distribu distribution and seasonality of rainfall, ranging from sub-regions characterised as wet in the north to semi-arid regions in the south, and this is represented by this uh, colour-coded um, Kepler uh, climate, uh, climate determinant, uh, as well as considerable range and degree in temperature, both geographically and on a month-by-month -month basis. The most influential aspects of this complex system are topographical variation and the nature of wind currents, for these act in particular upon the distribution of precipitation. <clears throat> and I'm not going to talk you guys through um, all the wind patterns of, 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 of the earth because it's ineffably complex and I don't really understand it myself. Um, but the bottom right is a, is a representation of the seasonal um, distribution of the, uh, the North Atlantic uh, oscillation. And then at the top there is sort of wind patterns and how the Coriolis effect makes wind patterns basically uh, slant either to the west, um, the, the southwest, or to the uh, to the northeast. And I don't want to answer questions about that um, at, at the end of the, of the talk. <clears throat> uh, while it is by no means straightforward to infer general climatic trends of the past from the conditions of the present, it seems reasonable to suggest that the geography of the region, at least, has changed little in historical times. When one turns to the issue of change in the climatic conditions of the region as opposed to the considerable interregional and interannual variation that this particular climate system experiences, the factors that are most likely to have been influential are wind patterns and solar activity, which together impact upon relative humidity and can therefore be connected to precipitation. And the illustration on the bottom left here is giving a sense of um, why it's important that the Earth tilts like this. Uh, because the amount of sun is actually falling differentially on different parts of the globe uh, as a result. While due caution is necessary, given the nature of the evidence and the relative coarseness of the picture that can be created, it's possible to sketch broadly the climatic conditions of the late Roman Empire and to speculate about the effect these might have had on peasants' abilities to fulfil their subsistence needs. And what I have here is a very basic cut-down um, approximation of uh, temperature, temperature deviation from a notional mean, which is the zero line, and the red firm line is um, the means, and then you've got the, the minima and maxima above and below it. And then this one on the top here is basically precipitation totals. Now this is um, basically agglomerated and averaged across the whole of the Mediterranean. So um, it's a fairly coarse um, uh, representation. But I think you can get a general sense, because they've given us helpfully uh, the periods. You can get a general sense from this of, of uh, what I'm, what I'm going to just tell you. Uh, while due caution is necessary, uh, given the nature of the evidence, uh, we can speculate about this. In general terms, it's been suggested that the climate of the Mediterranean world in the period between around 100 BCE and 200 CE was exceptionally stable, and in many regions, uh, particularly favourable. This suggestion is based upon evidence for glacial retreat, dendro data, pollen markers, and proxy indicators of solar activity which all indicate generally warmer conditions than preceding centuries. This stability is sometimes labelled the Roman optimum, and in recent scholarship it's been explicitly connected with the expansion of Roman political and military hegemony across the Mediterranean world and Europe. From around the third century, however, this stability appears to have given way to a greater degree of variability in both temperature and precipitation. And this is more or less where the migration period um, is, is coming in. <coughs> This pattern manifests itself at different rates and along different temporal trajectories in the western and eastern halves of the area under Roman control, but it is nevertheless observable across the whole Mediterranean region. The evidence from the eastern Mediterranean suggests increased incidence of droughts over the third century, although it is at present unclear whether the decrease in the precipitation uh, in such evidence suggests uh, was accompanied by marked temperature changes or not. In the western provinces, the situation is a little clearer and the prevailing trend appears to be towards cooler, drier conditions, punctuated by an apparent increase in volcanic activity, 
which served to perturb interannual climatic stability still further. Beginning in 300 CE or so, I like the way that this is also periodised by century because I think that's an important um, indication of just how rough and ready and coarse um, these approximations are. Uh, beginning in 300 CE or so, this cooling trend appears to have stopped and by the second half of the fourth century to have reversed into a warming trend, again accompanied by relatively stable conditions, albeit perhaps somewhat drier than during the Roman optimum. These conditions in turn gave way to a wetter climate over the course of the fifth and ensuing centuries, with generally cooler temperatures potentially further exacerbated by considerable volcanological activity, including a massive explosive eruption of a thus far unidentified volcano in the mid-530s, which appears to have led to a marked reduction in insulation, uh, that's the amount of sunlight that actually reaches the Earth, uh, across the Mediterranean. And this has somewhat whimsically been connected uh, with the year that Merlin is supposed to have died um, in Britain by, by a couple of scholars in a sort of a, a rather um, provocative way. At the same time, the period between around the 4th and 6th century seems to display also a marked dryness in Italy and some other regions of Europe, and perhaps also an increase in summer temperatures. The two may be linked for the central and western Mediterranean at least and seem to indicate an increase in climatic variability in the region. Finally, it seems likely that in later centuries this variability once again stabilised somewhat with the result that the 7th century witnessed generally warmer and moister conditions than had previously existed. Clear? <clears throat> this broad narrative is attractive and compelling. Uh, it recognises interregional variation and acknowledges the differential rates and timescales at which the various different markers of environmental conditions operate. For our current purposes, however, two phenomena remain rather unclear. First, considerable debate continues to revolve around the relationship between the means, averages or maxima that can be derived from the proxy data and the distribution of those values over the course of a year. That is between interannual variation and intraannual variation. And this um, graphic at the top um, is giving you a sense of variation in precipitation and temperature season by season in the Mediterranean. And basically what it's saying is that green is when you want to be growing, but blue and yellow vary markedly over a year. So this is intraannual variation. The distinction between these two is crucial for it is arguably the degree and rate of climatic variability that is most significant in the impact of climate on society. In his detailed and convincing treatment of the period, McCormick sees considerable fluctuation in rainfall and temperature with alternating periods of warming and cooling over the course of the 5th to 7th centuries. Crucially, he also argues for changes in the nature of both early summer and spring rainfall on the basis of changes in the distribution of grains in the archaeological record for northeastern Europe. Currently, the data upon which McCormick bases this hypothesis is too thin to make his argument completely compelling. Nevertheless, the implication that we must pay attention to variation in the intra-annual distribution of rainfall, and in particular uh, at crucial times in the agricultural year, is salutary. This relationship remains poorly understood and requires a gra much greater investment in plant and pollen studies across a much greater geographical area if it is to be further explicated. More complex still, oh, and this, this representation on the bottom right is basically showing the variation between maxima, minima, and, and means and averages, just to give you a sense of, of how creating means basically flattens the data to a point where it's actually not terribly um, useful or helpful. <clears throat> More complex still is the relationship between climate and human agency in the environmental phenomena that are observable in the archaeological and geological record. And of course, this is another way in which modern concerns are being backdated and, and pushed into, into the, the discussions of, of ancient climate. The problem can best be illustrated by the question of stream bed alluviation in the middle of the first millennium CE. In 1969, Claudio Vita Finzi identified a phenomenon of alluvial aggradation in many areas of the Mediterranean basin, which he termed the younger fill. And the younger fill is uh, here. And basically what Vita Finzi is saying is that at a certain point in the middle of the, the first millennium, a whole bunch of soil and um, suspended particles from rivers falls into the riverbed, which means that the rivers are going slower and it, that has impacts. Well, the rivers are actually moving 
faster because they're carrying more of this stuff. Sorry, and that means that there is more rainfall, which means that the conditions are moister. Now, the question, once this has been identified, is whether this is because humans have done stuff, they've changed the, the environment in ways where they've controlled streams or rivers, or um, whether this is something that is purely climatological and humans are just trying to respond to it. Uh, and in fact, um, arguments have uh, been made on both sides of this, of this particular debate. Uh, the question remains open, but in the present context, we should recognise that the two have combined differently in different regions, sometimes perhaps more human factors, sometimes perhaps more environmental factors. Certainly the behaviour of rivers and streams, their flooding regimes, the quantity and velocity of water flow, and their movement across their beds is a crucial piece of the puzzle in any attempt to reconstruct the environmental conditions of the period. For among other things, these phenomena reflect the seasonal or intra-annual distribution of rainfall. Data sets are growing rapidly, and while the question of human impact upon the behaviour of these rivers is likely to remain controversial, the field promises much to future researchers. The relationship between agricultural populations and their environments is a delicate one, <coughs> and climatic conditions and agricultural practices are intimately connected. It's therefore not surprising that scholars would expect to be able to observe changes in one phenomena mirrored by changes in the other. <coughs> However, even in present contexts, it's notoriously difficult to establish coherent and convincing relationships between environmental or climatic factors on the one hand and agricultural phenomena on the other. <coughs> it's also crucial that we establish what we mean by change or changes and clarify the scale upon which we envisage these phenomena. We may imagine, for example, that relatively slow changes over long periods of time are more easily adapted to than more sudden upheavals and that sudden upheavals need not necessarily be particularly extreme to have a significant effect. But these are qualitative, subjective judgments rather than quantifiable measures. Simply put, if climate is to be seriously considered as a contributor to an agricultural crisis in the late Roman period, factors such as rainfall, water levels, temperature, and seasonal variability must be demonstrated to have altered relatively suddenly and this alteration must be shown to have had a negative impact upon crop production and land productivity. Scholars have long noted significant changes in the distribution, size, and numbers of, of agricultural installations in the period, and there is growing evidence for changes in both crop types and the balance between cereal-based agriculture and pastoralism. But to what extent should these changes be attributed, either directly or indirectly, to environmental or climatic imperatives? And are the observed changes uncontrovertibly responses to negative pressures rather than positive adaptations to beneficial conditions? As a first step towards evaluating these questions, it's worth sketching briefly the prevailing trends in settlement and exploitation patterns that are observable in the archaeological record. Almost without exception, it would seem that in Western Europe, the period between around 200 and 600 CE, witnessed a reduction in the number of identifiable sites in the countryside. A range of interpretations has been tended to explain this phenomenon, including catastrophic demographic decline as a result of warfare, plague, fiscal and economic pressure, and general instability, widespread urban drift, reorganisation of settlement patterns and practices amounting to agglomeration and concentration of settlement, and shifts in economic regimes that fundamentally altered both the number and type of sites and the proportions of the population involved. However, generalised and generalising interpretations are gradually losing ground to more nuanced micro-regional studies, which reveal much more complex and varied processes in the period. Broadly speaking, the archaeological evidence from the Western Mediterranean reveals a gradual process of transformation in the distribution, size and numbers of sites over the course of this period. Urban agglomerations, that is towns and cities, largely continued although they do not appear to have expanded in size. Small dispersed hamlets, villas and farmsteads also appear to have continued, although both survey and excavation suggests that these reduced in number and increased in relative size. Roman villas continued to be the most visible sites in the landscape, although increasingly scholars are recognising that these sites did not necessarily dominate the late Roman landscape and dictate patterns of settlement and economic exploitation in quite the way that was long thought. <coughs> However, the task of teasing out the multiplicity of relationships between these sites and the varied collection of non-villa sites that have been revealed by recent 
projects remains challenging. <clears throat> Further, when we move beyond identifying broad patterns and seek to explicate the specific trajectories of particular regions, it is diversity and variation that emerges most clearly. This can be succinctly illustrated with reference to rural settlement in Gaul, modern France, in the period. While in northern Gaul, for example, uh, an apparent reduction in the number of villas was matched by an increase in sites that might be identifiable as farmsteads and hamlets, so that looks like a reorganisation of settlement rather than a, uh, a movement of people or a reduction in population. South of the Seine, uh, this is in the central part, uh, <coughs> all of these site types appear to have declined together with non-villa sites disappearing at a greater rate than villas. Further south still, in southeastern Gaul, a bulge in rural site numbers that attended incorporation into the economic networks of the Roman imperial system in the first two centuries CE gradually diffused over the course of the next few hundred years. At a finer level of granularity still, some specific micro-regional case studies may be examined. The Albana Valley in Tuscany, this is, this, is this, uh, this one in the top left here, seems to have been a region where agriculture was only imposed and maintained with some difficulty. And it's recently been argued that decline in the late Roman period may represent an inability to maintain control over the marshlands. Although it's again debatable whether this was a result of purely human or environmental factors or indeed a combination of the two. Elsewhere in Tuscany, and this is, uh, this is the, the representation on the other side. Links have been posited between change in climatic factors and the siting of settlement in river valleys, and it's therefore not inappropriate to suggest that the apparent decline in site numbers and density in some areas may be attributable as much to movement of settlement as to depopulation. From the observed steady movement of settlement up the slopes of Vacareccia in the Volturno Valley in Molise, and this is a, a section of that movement uh, in the top right-hand corner there, it's an attractive inference that this change in site location was a response to environmental conditions. Some literary evidence might suggest an increase in moisture in some parts of Italy, at least. But it also illustrates the caution with which we must approach such evidence. In the area around Ravenna, there's a reference in Enodius's life of Epiphanius to the flooding of the Po River and a resulting dispute over the boundaries of adjoining farms. However, Ravenna and the Po region uh, were always marshy environments and this reference cannot be taken as evidence that the river had recently changed its bed or that it was flooding more regularly than it had in the past. Similarly, Rutilius Nematianus's remarks that Graviscae is considered unhealthy in the summer forms part of a long tradition of references to this area in such a way. It's therefore difficult to evaluate any potential effects of this increased moisture if indeed it even happened. We're left then uh, with a rather thorny and unsatisfying problem. That there was an increase in precipitation in the fifth century may be a reasonable supposition. But at the current state of our knowledge, this doesn't get us very far. It's apparent that both the causes and the effects of increased moisture in the period are unclear, as are the implications of this process for peasants beyond the possibility that uh, they may have been forced to move their settlements elsewhere in some regions uh, uh, as a result of streambed alluviation or other changes in the course or behaviour of certain rivers. As a corollary to this, the effects of a climate with more sharp seasonal variation upon peasants and their cropping strategies are currently also unclear. Perhaps it's here that McCormick's hypothesis about changes in cultivars is relevant. As has been noted with reference to the problem of climatic effects on different crops in the so-called Little Ice Age between the early 14th and the late 19th centuries. In order to test this hypothesis more firmly, we would need to develop a model for response to climate of each of the individual grains themselves before incorporating that information into a larger model. We currently lack data sets of sufficient robustness to do this, uh, but it may not be very long before it can be done. It's clear that no single developmental trajectory in agricultural practices or rural settlement in the late antique period can be discerned, and therefore no single interpretative narrative is sufficient. But historians abhor an interpretational vacuum, and as a consequence they have sought explanatory paradigms capable of encompassing immense variation across both time and space. Historical narratives of political instability, military and fiscal pressure, and cultural upheaval have been shown to be insufficient. It is therefore now the turn of climatic and environmental factors. 
Most broadly, for example, it's been suggested that a climatic downturn triggered a widespread and fundamental systems collapse in the western provinces of the erstwhile Roman Empire. The climatic downturn, I'm quoting here, that began around 500 CE wiped the slate clean and what began to emerge 200 years later was completely new. In most of the West, political and military shocks, then the coming of plague, only exaggerated the effects of failed crops and famine in a world where even in the best of times, human fertility barely held its own against mortality. The archeology span of the rural world reveals an infrastructure in decay or in ruins, drainage and irrigation ditches clogged, terrace walls collapsing, roads no longer maintained. This development in the countryside occurs at the same time that portions of many urban centres begin to decay and are eventually abandoned. We are surely looking at a circle, or in systems language, a feedback loop. While the language of systems acknowledges uh, the positions espoused by climate historians of the 1980s, the position here is little different from that espoused by Huntington in 1917. More nuanced and operating at a different level of granular granularity, is the position of McCormick, who acknowledges the challenge of resolving vast disparities in the temporal horizons of the historians and climate scientists. But McCormick shares with Huntington and other more modern historians of climate change in late antiquity an impulse to identify a single phenomenon in need of explanation, namely change. In fact, both change and continuity need to be explained. Both can be regarded as responses to pressures but it is changes that are most clearly visible in the record, and it is therefore changes that are deemed most requiring of explanation. The emergence of rye as a cultivar in Northern Europe during the fifth and sixth centuries is a case in point, as too are changes in the stature of cattle skeletons over the same period. While it's true that both phenomena need to be accounted for, so too do circumstances where there is no evidence for change and such circumstances are undeniably present in the archaeological record, even if they are less analytically interesting and as a consequence accorded less attention in the scholarly literature. Our problem is further complicated by the possibility that the same pressures might be responded to in different ways or might have positive or negative effects in different contexts. In fact, very little in an agriculturalist's life is not changing whether it be on a seasonal or annual scale or over the course of its life cycle, a household will experience a significant change and or fluctuation in its available labour force and the number of mouths it needs to feed, the volume of land available for cultivation or requiring to lay fallow, and the extractive demands of landlords, patrons and the state for surpluses. Not to mention the timing and amount of precipitation, the incidence of particularly violent or unexpected storms, or sudden changes in temperature or wind patterns which may ruin or seriously damage a given crop. As a consequence of this almost infinite variability in both the resources available for and the constraints acting upon their activity, agriculturalists are constantly adjusting and adapting their economic behaviour. They develop complex collections of strategies for managing the risk of catastrophic crop failure and for responding quickly and effectively to events which threaten to deprive them of food or resources. These strategies include intercropping of food crops that have different or complementary climatic tolerances, or make different nutrient demands of the soil, sowing quick growing crisis crops at particular times of need, and so on. To extend a particularly evocative image of the balance between a household's demands and its resources, in effect the farmer is aiming at a moving target with a weapon of gradually shifting calibre. It's likely that the weapon in question has been chosen on the basis of a combination of inductive reasoning, experience and available resources, and it's worth posing questions about the parameters within which the farmer is able to adjust its bore. But whatever answers we arrive at about the flexibility or margins of agriculturalists' risk, man risk management strategies, it seems incontrovertible that change in observable economic practices is likely to be a product of a host of factors. Equally, continuation of existing economic practices might occur in spite of changes in some or all of those factors. It's therefore not the transformation of agricultural practices in the period that needs explanation, at least not in isolation, even if such a fundamental and widespread transformation did in fact take place, and I'm not yet convinced that it did. The assumption that this is the explanandum 
at the expense of other phenomena is a product of the project of historians more broadly and the traditional concerns of scholars of the late Roman world in particular. We have long taken it as our mission to identify differences, place those differences in a chronological sequence and account for them. This process of description and explication of difference then becomes an explanation of change. It's certainly not my intention to deny the heuristic force of the historical project, I'd be out of a job, um, nor to suggest that we should not be seeking to understand change. It is simply to observe that change and continuity, and I deliberately put the little square quotes around them, uh, do not exist in some immutable relationship of opposition to one another. Rather, they are intimately and dialectically intertwined. Of course, historians of late antiquity, as of other periods, have long recognised this, and only a very few would now wish to suggest that the opposition between these two phenomena should stand at the heart of our analysis of the period. Equally, climate scientists are intensely aware of the fact that the system they are seeking to reconstruct is ineffably complex, characterised by feedback loops and interrelationships that are infinitely more elaborate than the most sophisticated model can ever hope to reflect. However, while both groups of scholars are clear on the existence of complexity and dialectical relationships in their own fields, they tend to ignore it or at best to flatten or minimise it in each other's. This tendency is again a product of the infancy of this particular interdisciplinary project, but it is especially problematic in the present context because of the vastly different temporal scales upon which the two disciplines customarily operate. A phenomenon that a climate scientist might regard as a sudden or rapid change, taking place over a period of a century or so, might appear to a historian as an instance of much more gradual transformation, or indeed not be visible at all. The problem is compounded by the fact that observations of individuals, such as may be captured in the textual record for antiquity, and have now been collected by McCormick and his collaborators into an immense and impressive online database, are intensely subjective and, in this particular instance, difficult to calibrate. We are therefore left with a sizeable grey area between two quite different understandings of what change actually means. Agriculture sits firmly in this grey area between these two temporal scales, for it represents the point at which humans and their environment interact in intimate, ongoing and a dialectical ways. Not only are farmers subject to the environmental conditions in which they find themselves, they are also in a position to impact those conditions. Manipulation of soil fertility through manuring or other practices is one such opportunity. And agronomic treatises and other ancient writings suggest that methods for revitalising the soil were highly sophisticated. In recent scholarship, great strides has been taken to complement this abstract or aspirational evidence with data that reflects actual manuring practices themselves using compound st stable isotope analyses and the measurement of various biomarkers in the soil. Manipulation of waterways and the imposition of specific kinds of field systems is also well attested. And scholars are, in addition, becoming much more conscious of the implications of such activities for soil erosion and other processes that might be considered detrimental to the environment and, as a consequence, potential factors leading to changes in agricultural practices. In the end, we're left with a rather unsatisfying set of questions and answers, which can only be con connected to one another by a rather simplistic or hopeful slate of hand. Did climatic conditions in the Mediterranean world change over the period between around 200 and 600? The evidence seems to suggest that they did, although the rate at which they did so and the particular forms that the changes took appear to have been somewhat heterogeneous. Did agricultural practices in the period change? Again, there is a certain amount of evidence to suggest that they did, at least in some circumstances. But it is less clear what the relationship might have been between those changes and any enduring continuities. And it is even less clear what role the changes in climatic conditions might have played. By cleaving towards climate as an explanatory principle, historians of the period are in a certain sense abrogating responsibility for explaining the immense variation in the processes that they see. They're also continuing to pay homage to interpretational paradigms of the period which militate that it be regarded as a period of decline or at best transformation. Studies of the climatic conditions of the Mediterranean world over the course of the past two millennia, and indeed earlier still, promise to offer much to our understanding of the societies that inhabited that world. The relationship between the agricultural populations of the late Roman period 
and the physical worlds in which they lived is undeniably in need of explication. But we must be careful to ask questions of the scientific data that it is able to answer and to acknowledge the manifold and manifest limitations that continue to attend it, rather than to regard it as our last best hope for explicating the questions that our own discipline has forced us to contemplate. Thank you. We will now have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Neither Kala or I will come by with the microphone. As always, preference goes to students. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, sort of, you spoke um, briefly about the sort of limitations of things like textual evidence in particular. And I'm curious to hear sort of you expound a bit more upon that because I know that there are some instance, instances in which we've learned like things that there would be no other way for us to know through things like textual evidence. So um, I'm thinking in particular of like syphilium or the birth control um, sort of plant that would extinct yep. as a result of sort of overuse by Romans. But then we also have extremely inaccurate second or third hand descriptions of like giraffes and things that are just wildly wrong. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious um, sort of how you navigate that when you're trying to determine what textual evidence um, is useful and what is, is misleading. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> well, welcome to the historical project. I mean, that, that's, that's absolutely um, the problem that we face. Um, in the 1960s, a historical climatologist named H.H. H. Lamb wrote a, a fabulous book. It's this big, whopping great book that is still really the, the standard work in doing historical um, climatology. And he talks about what gets noticed by people, what they write down and what they don't write down. You know, um, do you write down that it... I mean, you know, I was talking with, uh, with, with some of these guys uh, earlier today. Do you write down when it was a nice day the same as it was yesterday? Do you write down when it was been six months of really, really unseasonably cold weather? Do you write down when a volcano hit? What do you write down? What don't you write down? What are the accidents that go into what you record and what you don't record? So that's sort of one level at which relying on the, the anecdotal evidence for anything other than sort of anecdotal fluff is, is tricky. And the next way in which it's tricky is that, you know, <clears throat> there are so very many accidents in terms of what texts have survived, um, where they're located geographically, what the relationships between those texts might or might not be. I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't be using the texts. I'm a historian. I love texts. But, <clears throat> but it's very difficult, um, it's very difficult to, to work out what sort of interpretative weight we should be putting on these texts. And um, this database that's been constructed is an extraordinary piece of work. Um, and it allows for a whole bunch of potentially very interesting um, questionings of the literature. But I fear that what people are going to do is go into it and say, I can find 27 instances of unseasonably cold weather in the period between 360 and 372, which means that the period between 360 and 372 across the Mediterranean was unseasonably cold. And you can see how that's a, a sort of a really flawed um, way of going about the, 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 the process. <clears throat> and the, the final response, which is, again, not to say that the data is no good. It's just to say that, as with all of our data, it, it requires that we, we engage with it in a, in a, a very self-conscious um, and self-critical way. Um, there was a, a, a relatively recent catalogue of earthquakes that was published um, and it was all earthquakes in the eastern Mediterranean between 400 and 1300, or between, yeah, so a period of 900 years. Textual representations, textual attestations. And the, the authors claim that of all of those attestations, about 70% are either doublets, that is repeated attestations of one earthquake, or completely spurious. Now, I, I mean, I, I don't have a, a measure for just testing whether that's a, 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 a hypothesis that is reasonable. But even if it's only 30% or 25% that are problematic, then the sorts of things that we can do with the texts is, uh, you know, is reduced. Now, the challenge then is to make the texts do something useful and meaningful for us. And I think that that's sort of where I am. I'll, I'll freely admit that this is a negative paper. This is a paper saying this is what I don't think we can do yet. And you know, invite me back in five or six or seven years' time, I'll try and tell you what I think we can do. Um, I'm not. I'm not there yet, but that's sort of where I'm. Where I'm trying to go. Mm. 
Thank you for a, a wonderful uh, paper, uh, Cam. I was wanting to press you a little bit more about your reasons why you think the, that uh, the climate change between around 400 and 600 are not, was not really compelling. You, in a sort of throwaway line, you sort of said you uh, were not yet convinced about them. And, and so, uh, after all, that is, that is where the decline, the end of the West would, would fall naturally, and one suspects that the text is, is leading the climactic and all of the other environmental factors. So I would like, want to press you a bit more about why you're not convinced yet. Oh, I'm convinced that climate changed. I don't have a problem with, with acknowledging that. I have, I, have, I have no doubts that the broad trajectories of the, of the, the narrative of climate change is, is pretty good. Um, and, I, and I think that McCormick and his collaborators have, have given us compelling reasons to, to believe that in terms of, of the multi-proxy um, data sets that they've produced for us. Um, I think where the problem comes in for me is in thinking through issues of scale, both in terms of geography and in terms of chronology. Um, the issues of scale in terms of geography, I think, are that it's true that broadly speaking you can rhetorically construct climatic conditions over the whole of the Mediterranean and Europe with a, a fairly great degree of confidence. But you know yourself from you know, driving and walking around Italy that the same day you can be in two different parts of two different valleys or on, on, you know, within 10 or 15 kilometres of one another and the experience of the weather is entirely different. So I worry that this large scale narrative is getting lost in the micro regions. And we keep on saying we've got to do micro regional analyses. Of course we do. Um, how are we going to do it? And I'm, again, I'm, I'm being negative, but I, I, I think that we have to take more seriously that call to do micro regional analyses. So that's, that's one issue of scale. The other issue of scale is, is an issue around whether a 200 year period is sudden or not. And I've been trying to think this through in my own mind. Um, by thinking about things like farmers' almanacs and the inductive reasoning that goes into um, adapting to climatic variability. So you can imagine a world where, um, notionally at least as an agriculturalist, I've got where I want to be in terms of climatic conditions is sort of here in the middle. And I know that in this zone where I know where the temperature and the rainfall is going to be and I know when the rains are going to happen and I'm pretty comfortable with how seasonal variations are going to go, I plant these crops that I love and I'm really pretty comfortable that they're going to give me the, the return that I want. Now next year, the temperature is here. And so there's my margin there. And then the following year, the temperature is here and so there's my margin there. How many years does it need to take before either I'm completely out of my comfort zone, in which it's a, it's a catastrophic failure for me and I'm really struggling. Or I've adapted inductively my responses to climate and so I'm actually proactively um, changing what I'm doing. And this is where I think McCormick's argument about rye is really interesting. Um, it, it doesn't come in the, in the big survey article that I was talking about. It comes in a, a little interpretative piece that he wrote um, in, a, in a volume about uh, climate change. And he just throws this idea out. It's a very McCormick sort of uh, strategy. He throws this idea out and says, maybe it's this. Maybe the reason that rye is being grown here at this time is because over a period of time, people realised that it was getting colder and wetter and rye was a better option. Now, that says that climate changed, which I'm perfectly happy to acknowledge. It doesn't say that, that farmers were having a difficult time of it, necessarily. And it's in putting those two things together um, unreflectively that I'm sort of having trouble. I'm trying to pull those two things apart and make them speak to one another in a slightly different way. Because as far as narratives of climate change at the big picture, I'm all on board with that. I think the data is, is, is uh, relatively convincing. But what does that tell us? Like, so what? You know, that's, that's, that's description. Let's, let's work out how to, how to do something interpretational with it. Does that, I mean, does that sort of answer or does it at least deflect? <coughs> That's where I'm interested. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. 
how many more would I like or how many more are going to come up? I, 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 I don't know. And, and, I, and I think that in reality, the answer to that question has to lie in working out how to get away from the fetishization of quantification. That is, at what point, at, at what point do we say, you know, look, I, I've, got, I've got six pieces of data spread over 2,000 square kilometres. It's not a meaningful data set. But I don't want to not use the data set. I want to use that data set. So how do I use that data set in a way that acknowledges its thinness but um, grabs hold of its considerable heuristic potential? And you know, in the first instantiation of this project, as I was imagining it, um, what I was going to do was I was going to take you know, five or six really, really closely detailed micro-regional studies. And I was like, well, the first thing that I'll do is I'll find my texts. Right? I'll go and I'll get my texts and I'll get my thick descriptions from the texts. Uh, and then I'll layer environmental and ge geological and, and archaeological data on top. Right now, that can't be done. I don't know if it can ever be done. <coughs> and I'm, you know, I'll be honest, I don't have the expertise or the connections to make it happen. I can't dial up my friend in France and say, can you spend $100,000 on doing detailed soundings geologically and, and uh, climatologically and pollen data in this 100 square kilometre region? So we. It's, it's not going to happen. The amount of data that we want, ideally, is not going to happen. Not in our lifetime. Um, but the data is so awesome that we've got to work out better ways to, to play with it. I'm going to jump into the question real quick. Please. Um, one of the key issues that you identified was that there's just this fundamental distinction between the time scales that a climatological scientist is going to work with, time scales that a historian is going to work with. Um, if we're thinking in terms of generations, right, like you're not going to notice a lot of what might be fundamentally important shifts in the climate over the course of even two or three generations. So is it even possible to go about reconciling those two distinctions? Are there inflection points which can be corroborated with something that would be relevant enough for a Roman historian to write down? Um, or are we just going to be firing blind? Yeah. Um. I mean, uh, I could just say I'm not sure, but let, let me let me try and let me try and think about that because that's you know that's the again that's the sort of the fundamental challenge of of doing history more broadly, um, and it's especially the fundamental challenge of of doing history that is using differential data sets, and we have to do that kind of work. That's that's where the fun stuff is, um, but it's also where the, where the real challenges are. Um, one of the ways of answering that question. Uh, would be by recourse to what the archaeologists used to call middle range theory. Um, and, and middle range theory, broadly speaking, and I'm going to apologise in advance for the archaeologists in the room who know in detail what middle range theory is because I'm going to butcher it terribly. Um, but basically the argument is um, <clears throat> you've got stuff that talks about moments and you've got stuff that talks about long term processes. But the interesting part is the bit in the middle that you're talking about where moments and processes interact. And to really start jumping from, from uh, interpretative principle to interpretative principle, the way to help to inflect that question in middle range theory is by recourse to a set of intellectual paradigms drawn from French historical scholarship. In the Annal School of French historical scholarship, there are three broad scales of temporality. There's the sort of the, uh, the long durée, the sort of the slow breathing in and out of the, the environment. And then there's the moyen durée, the, the, uh, the conjunctures, the sort of structures and institutions of, of, of life. And then les événements, the sort of the frothy stuff um, of day-to-day of -day events like people dying and wars and stuff. And an our school history locates itself principally in... Uh, the conjunctures. And so there are all sorts of ways in which um, in recent scholarship and interpretations of that the relations between these temporal scales have been placed in dialogue with one another. So yes it can be done um, but again it's a, it's a multi-step process to, to get to a place where you feel comfortable putting a 5,000 year long core and somebody saying gee it got cold for, for, for six years here and we really didn't like it very much. <coughs> Dante, in the back. Thank you. Uh, 
you, you try to uh, to to uh, uh, find correlation between uh, weather and agriculture, as a, uh, and I I may have missed from the distance, but I I was wondering whether uh, there is not another factor that uh, uh, treating agriculture as a product production uh, and uh, try to correlate it to fluctuation in population. You did speak about density, but uh, uh, there are fascinating uh, examples uh, that a layman like me uh, gets with certainty of to the number of people in Europe in uh, 600 or whatever, and uh, clearly uh, it is a factor, uh, agriculture will be a, a logical factor yep. uh, that respond to the number of people yep. that exist at all. Yep. So I would like to hear your comment. Absolutely. Um, I would love to be able to tell you about population numbers. That would make me very, very happy. Um, it would also give me a personal chair at any prestigious university in the world. Um, <clears throat> population numbers in antiquity, the, the determination of population numbers is is black box magic science. Um, there's, there's really nothing to work with, or what we have to work with is again at several removes. Let me give you, let me give you a, a sort of a, a, an example and I'll expand a little bit on, on what, I was, what I was talking about. Um, <clears throat> the principal way of discovering um, the presence of people in the countrysides of, of Europe is through survey archaeology. And survey archaeology is a process whereby you walk through a field counting sherds of pottery. And depending on the concentration and numbers of sherds of pottery in a particular place, you make hypotheses about what kind of a site is underneath the ground. And those sherds of pottery have been turned up by the plough. Um, and this, in fact, is something that started happening since the middle of the 20th century when they turned to much deeper ploughs. So more ceramics were being turned up. <clears throat> now, in a landscape then, after the, plough, the ploughing has happened, you can walk across it and you can say, look, there's a really strong and heavy concentration of, of really quite rich and wonderful pottery there. And then over there, there's a very weak and diffuse population of pottery um, that might be a much smaller and much poorer site. And then over there, I've got three sort of half scatters that have interesting ceramics in them that mean that maybe there was some stuff that came in from somewhere else. <clears throat> Now, in many cases, that's the only evidence we have for the presence of people in the landscape. And we need, we try, we try to come up with ways of translating density and size of pottery into real numbers. And in terms of, of, of actual numbers, you know, we can go to occasional battle narratives that say 100,000 people were killed in this battle. Um, <clears throat> or it can say, uh, the population of this city uh, was 25,000 and the disaster wiped out 20,000 of them. So we have these sort of spurious numbers and we have uh, attempts to connect pottery with people and people with objects and collections of pottery bits in landscapes with each other in a sort of a multi-dimensional way. And then we turn to um, sort of speculative interpretation and try and put numbers down on it. Um, you're absolutely right that population numbers in terms of both demand and um, the labour possibility to produce is an absolutely key factor in any of these questions around agricultural productivity in the period. Um, <clears throat> But as with many elements of ancient history, this is an area where we almost completely lack data, um, uh, which is very frustrating. But I, I agree with you. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have. Please join me in thanking Dr. Cam Gray. Thank you.